for you today. I've got to take my glasses off because I don't like the way they reflect. I don't like the way they reflect. What's happening, Boot Junkies? Mike Dog Audio here, back with another video on Home Studio Setup for VoiceOver. That's backwards. And today, we have a new interface in the booth that we're going to talk about, the Audient ID14. Before we get into the device, I do want to say immediately up front that the good folks at Audient sent this to me uh, before it came out. They have uh, rebranded their logo. They've updated these devices. These are the Mark II devices that I'm going to talk about, the ID14 that I'm going to talk about in this video. I, so they sent it to me beforehand. I get to keep the device. So it's going to say includes paid promotion because I get to keep the device. But I do want to say I'm not sponsored by Audient. They don't give me any money. They just sent me the, the device. And I want to disclose that to you. They don't get any um, editorial input on what I'm going to say. They're going to see this video at the same time you are. If you're seeing it after it came out, I did get a pre-production model, so there may be some very, very slight differences. It would probably be in functionality and firmware. I think the device is pretty well locked in. Uh, but in case you're seeing this sometime after uh, the Mark II came out and it looks different, acts different, uh, it's because the version I got was a pre-production model. Uh, and th things, things could change over time. Great big thank you. Great big thank you to the good folks over at Audient for sending this over to me. I'm really grateful for it. Uh, and I hope to display, uh, to show you how this thing works, what it can do, what it might be good for, to help you decide if it's the right device for you. I can't make that decision for you. I can only let you hear it and let you see it. What you're going to hear is through, right now, through the Rode NT1 microphone into the Audient ID14. So this would be a very representative kind of setup that a new uh, or a transitioning voice actor who might be looking to take their work up uh, a level from maybe some more entry level stuff that they've been working with. Um, this, this would be a, a very typical setup that you could make money with. You could make money with this, this setup all day long. Audiobooks, commercials, e-learning, IVR. There's a whole bunch of stuff that you could do with this exact setup right here. And it will probably cost you not knowing exactly what the IT, ID14, I'm going to say this whole rig would probably cost you less than 500 bucks. Mike's three, shy of 300 to call it 275. I think the ID14, I, I'm going to say it's 299 or less is my guess, is my guess. I honestly, I don't know. So that's a guess. Uh, link in the description um, to whatever the latest price is. Um, so that'll take you to whatever the current price of the device is. Before we jump into it, Let's talk about what an interface is. An interface is a device that goes between the microphone and your computer, and it, one, pre-amplifies the signal that the microphone uh, puts out. If, if the microphone requires it, as this one does, if this requires electricity in order to work, the interface will supply that electricity whenever you turn the switch on. It will also do any of the, con the conversion from the analog signal that the microphone makes to the digital signal that the computer needs. That's what the interface does. It goes in between. So there, I always hear about people like, I bought an XLR, I bought a condenser microphone, and I'm trying to plug it right into the laptop. It doesn't work like that. You need an interface, this device, to go in between. And the most important part of the interface, for my opinion, is the preamplifier. How good a job does it do turning the microphone's signal that my voice going into it, how well does it amplify and convert? For a voice actor, for podcasters, you generally want a, a preamplifier, one that doesn't alter the sound. So the sound that's ending up on disc should sound like my voice. It shouldn't add any what they call color to it. It shouldn't make it sound muddy. It shouldn't make it sound excessively bright. It shouldn't do any of those things. And it should not add any additional noise. Sometimes preamplifiers will add a little noise that just exists. In my book, a preamplifier shouldn't degrade your signal in any way. Okay, so let's take a look at the device itself. And we're just going to go through the features of it. We'll show you how it works, some of the things that you can expect, and you'll get to take a listen to it as we go. We're just going to work left to right, and along the way, I'll tell you why some of these features may be appropriate for 
the voice actor. The ID14 is a two input interface. So two microphones, there are two microphone preamplifiers in it. Now, right off the bat, it's, it says on the, on the website that this is a 10 in and like six out uh, preamplifier or interface. And that's a little bit of, it's, I'm going to say that's some marketing speak. What this really is, this device by itself, this device is a two input, two output. Maybe you could say a three output because there's a headphone out and two sets of monitor. But anyway, it's two input. There is a uh, there is a an expansion port in the back called an ADAT port, an optical port, that if you wanted to hook up up to eight additional preamplifiers in a unit, you could put that in. But it doesn't come with it. That would be something that you pay extra for. So it's capable of up to 10 inputs because you can add eight via a, a port in the back. Uh, but this device on its own, two in two microphone preamplifiers and a direct input. So if you do play guitar, have a keyboard that you want to just plug directly in and bypass the microphone preamps, you can plug that in right here. Can I do this? I still see it. So you can see the direct in there. Let's see if I can make that focus. Yeah. So there's a direct input there. You can make that, you can make that happen. So two microphone preamplifiers. Below each is a switch on whether or not you need to supply mic uh, uh, power to the microphone. It's called phantom power, and it's often represented with this sign that says 48V because it's 48 volts of power, very low amount of power, not a lot of uh, amperage or wattage or whatever that goes into it, but it's 48 volts. And that switch, you turn it, uh, you slide it to the right, you flip it to the right if you want to turn the microphone on, to the left if you want to turn it off. This is only needed for condenser microphones. So if you need, so if you have a large diaphragm condenser microphone, like the one that I have right here, this one requires that phantom power, then you turn that switch on. You just flip it over to the right. Above that is the gain knob. That's how loud you want the microphone to be. So if I turn the microphone down, my signal gets quieter. If I turn it up, it gets louder to the point where it might even clip, where you can exceed what the uh, microphone would put out. Uh, but you can adjust it using that gain knob, hardwired to the, to the unit. There are two of them. These two work exactly the same. They provide 58, uh, 58 decibels of gain. Uh, and so that will cover any shotgun mic. It's going to cover any large diaphragm condenser mic. And in my experience, it will, I've tested it, it will also power even the most difficult dynamic mics, certainly the most difficult dynamic mic that I have been able to find, and that is the Shure SM7B. Uh, It'll power that, no problem. You do have to turn the gain all the way up, but it will power it. No problem. So you just turn it all the way up, turn phantom power off, turn it all the way up, and it will power a 7B. No problem. Okay. In the center here are the meters. The meters just represent the signal that's going through. So as you can see, it's moving with my voice. So as I talk into the microphone, it will show the level. If you do exceed the capacity, uh, if the gain is up too high and you do clip it, it will go all the way up into the red. These meters will also represent if there's sound coming back from the computer. If there's sound coming back from the computer, it will also, those meters can also show that, uh, that input there, that, the amount of signal. Often you'll see it going up into the red. So if you're like playing music, you're using the, the converters in here to make this your sound card, you'll often see that going up into the red. Just to tell you that it's exceeding the, uh, the limits. The, it's, it's, it's fixing to clip, as I'd say. The signal is getting clipped at the top. It's exceeding the capacity of it. Okay. Uh, below the meter, there's a light that says USB. This is a USB powered device. You do need to connect it to a computer. The USB light will say that there is a good connection and that there is power being supplied. Back here, you'll see the USB connector itself. It is a USB-C connector that connects over to the computer. So if you're using a laptop, know that this is going to be powered off your laptop's battery also. And it's going to pull power from USB-C. It's USB-C on this end, but it could be USB 3 on the other end, there's a little bit of a, a thing you need to know about that is 
because this is getting its power, you see there's no power switch on this. It doesn't turn on or off. It's just connected. Whoops. It's just connected directly to the computer. So it is getting its power from the computer. Um, but USB-C can supply more power than a USB 3 hub can or USB 3 can supply. So uh, in the, if it does need to make a power compromise, it will not make a compromise on the interfaces, uh, on the preamplifiers. It will make the, the compromise on the volume level of the headphone out. So the headphones will get quieter. Just won't have as quite the same maximum volume. If you're powered over USB 3, that's not supplying uh, as much power as a USB-C port. The USB 3 has a little bit less power, so the headphones will get a little tiny bit quieter. They just can't go quite as loud. Should be really inconsequentially different for low impedance headphones that are like 60 or 32 ohm resistance but if you are trying to put a 250 ohm headphone to this know that if it's uh, usb 3.0 you might not have a power might not go as loud something to be aware of okay no big deal on the bottom here there are three different indicators and they are different functions that are that indicates what function is being applied to this big knob here looks like a volume knob but it's actually called the rotary encoder and what it does it's just it does different purposes depending on what mode you're currently in. So if you press the speaker icon, that controls the monitor out, the signal that's going out to the monitor so that you can uh, you can adjust that by turning it, and the level will change here. It can affect what's going out to the monitors. If you do it to the headphones, that will adjust what I hear in my headphones. So you can't see any change, but I can hear that changing the volume in my headphones. This mode will also say um, if you need to mute something. So if I needed to mute my headphones, I put it on headphone mode, press the button, and you see it's flashing here, and I can't hear. I can't hear anything in my headphones at the moment because this light is flashing. The same thing will happen over here with the speakers. You can mute the output to the monitors, which can be very handy because if you have open speakers, and an open microphone, you can often get feedback. So you want to be able to have just a one click to mute the to mute the monitors so that you don't get feedback into the microphone. And it also means you don't have to turn the knob down and then hope to get back to the right place before. You can just mute it and unmute it whenever you want. In the center is another button. In the center is another button for a, a function called ID. And on the, ID, uh, on the ID 14, this is a programmable button. There are different modes that you can apply for this button. By default, when you press ID, the rotary encoder turns into essentially the same thing as the center mouse wheel uh, on your mouse. So if there are, if you need to zoom or scroll, you can also rotate this and it will rotate what, what you see on the screen. You might be able to adjust a parameter on a plugin, uh, synthesizers, things like that. You might be able to apply it. It's going to depend on what the plugin is, what DAW you're using, and so forth. But this is called, the audience calls it scroll control. And if you think about it sort of, obje uh, sort of, um, uh, like the center wheel on your mouse, it's got some similar functions. On the ID14, you can map this button to other functions if you want it to do other functions. So in uh, as we said, that um, pressing the speakers and that will mute the, the speaker and pressing that will mute it. You may want to just dim the monitors down so that they go significantly quieter so you can have a conversation without changing your volume but still be listening. You can program this to be dim. You can program this button to be a sum to mono. So if you're if you're working normally with a stereo, uh, you can have it. Um, you can have that button automatically sum the thing to mono. So uh, you sub your output to sum your output to mono, so that you can make sure that the stereo image is not making it so that the mono image is sounds weird. You can make it mono with reverse polarity, so that uh, you can just make sure there's no weird cancellation. Uh, and there's some other functionality that's all handled through something called the ID drivers. So with this device, you get some software that it provides the drivers. It will work on its own just as a regular USB sound device. But if you really want to work the functionality of the device, you really want to install the ID software. And I'll try and give you some screen caps of the ID software just so you can see how it works. But it is 
programmable, and depending on which mode you have selected, will govern what this rotary encoder does. There you go. That's the top. On the front, I'll try and angle this here so that you can see it. Now, well, maybe I have to get get some B-roll there. Uh, but the uh, there's some more um, jacks on the front, and really that is for. Let's see. I can't really get that here for you. I pointed out the DI, and on this side there's two headphone jacks. So they count that as a. Uh, two outs and really you can plug two pairs of headphones in really it's uh it's it's one headphone signal that's split into two jacks there's the eighth inch jack and a quarter inch jack so depending on which kind of headphones in you can plug them in but they do both work concurrently but they are both attached to the single um the single volume knob so both people have to oops i'm sorry both people need to have the same volume in their headphones if you don't want that to be the case, you can program that in the ID software. You can have different headphone, different mixes go to different outputs uh, so that you can adjust, you know, how much of different signals you can have. And that brings us to the back of the device itself. As you can see here, I've got two monitor cables out. These cables are going out to, they could be external monitors. There, these happen to be going out to um, a recording device because I'm recording out of this signal in addition to recording into the computer. Sorry, I hit the I hit the microphone. But you have two sets of these outputs, and they're each individually programmable. So why would you need that? Why would that be handy? Why would you need to have four speakers or four sets of outputs? Because this isn't really like a surround sound device or anything like that. But what you would typically do in a studio is you might have couple of different scenarios. You might have uh, one scenario where you have your main monitors where you listen to music and then you might want to have a separate headphone uh, mix. So going out to a headphone amplifier where you might want to adjust what what uh, another performer is listening to. So if you have two people on two different microphones, person A can get one set of volumes in their headphones. They might hear themselves quietly and their guests loudly. Whereas on the other side, they might want to hear themselves quietly and me loudly or the host loudly. You can actually adjust it in the ID software. You can adjust how those different mixes would be applied and you can route them to the different, the different outputs, the headphone outs or the two different, two different monitor outs. That's actually really handy. That actually comes in a lot more handy than you might expect. Here, and you would see it here in this setup. So right now I said these two inputs are going to a, uh, a recording device but it would mean I don't have to also do this out to a, uh, I wouldn't have to pull out my powered speakers and I don't have to split my headphones. I can actually just route these different inputs to different things. So right now this is not going out to speakers. These outputs are actually going to uh, a recording device. Super cool, super cool. So really, really flexible, really flexible. Lastly, there's one more port on the back after the monitors. There's one more port on the back and that is an optical input um, jack and what that is is that really allows to connect allows you to connect via um, a special fiber optic cable called an adat cable uh toss link cable spdif cable there's sort of a bunch of different words it sort of can all describe a similar concept uh, i typically call this an adat cable uh, adat adat that that cable would allow you to connect it to a device that's got more microphone preamplifiers. Uh, so in this case, Audient also makes, as do other people, Audient makes a device that is uh, plug in here and it would allow you to have eight more preamplifiers. And it's essentially eight more of the same preamplifier that's in here, same design. And that actually can be, can be really handy. So if you were also going to hook this up to record a drum kit, to record a whole band, to record five guests in a podcast or something like that to have a great big group podcast this could be the brain and then you could just expand it with more microphone preamplifiers plugged right in here you don't have to buy a giant mixing board or anything like that so having that expansion i actually have it even though i'm just a, a single working voice actor that's actually i have one connected so as a working voice actor that might be handling many projects at once out of my studio 
it's actually really handy to have multiple pre-amplifiers. And I'll give you a use case, one that happens with the ID14 and then one that you can also think about as you expand. So as a working voice actor, I might have two different projects that are going concurrently. I might be working with an audiobook. That's my long-term project. That might be might take me a couple of weeks, a couple of months to do a big audiobook project. And one thing that you don't want to do with an audio audiobook project is change the gain from session to session, from chapter to chapter. So it is really helpful to be able to just dedicate one preamplifier to a project. Whereas I still need to audition and I might not be auditioning for the same kind of project. I might have an audition where I have to scream really loudly for a character for a video game, in which case I'd need to turn that preamp down. Or I might be doing something else where I need to turn the preamp up using a different microphone or something like that. Having the ability to have more than one preamplifier that I can dedicate to different projects, I now know I can keep input one locked to my long-term project. And input two, I can change for any other project that comes along. Really handy. So I also have, like I said, eight. I have a device with eight more. And that's for many of the projects that I have going. I've got a couple of long-term projects, big audio book projects. So I keep those different preamplifiers set. So I just know I switched to preamplifier one for this audiobook project. I keep two preamplifiers dedicated to my YouTube channel so that I don't mess with my YouTube channel. I don't have let my YouTube channel mess with my audio production channels. They all are dedicated to different things. And then I have a couple of others that are dedicated to different microphones or different projects or whatever, whatever, having the ability to expand really can make a, can make a huge, can make a huge improvement in your, in your workflow. So I encourage you to think about it, that if you're thinking that down the road, maybe you will want to do a podcast with many people with more than one other guest, consider looking at a device that can be expanded. Those expansion devices, they, they, can be anywhere from like four or five hundred bucks up to you know thousand couple of thousand bucks it all depends on what you're what you're looking to add on it all depends on what you're looking to add on but you can do a lot with this kind of device it can really grow with you that's what i want to emphasize to you something like the id14 is not an entry-level device you can make this so that it grows with you and you can continue to make money and streamline your operation and expand your operation as you become more proficient with your tools, as you acquire more clients, more projects, you can take on a wider variety of projects because you've gotten a device that can expand. Not a toy. This thing is not, not a toy. It doesn't look like a very sophisticated device, but the guts of it, very sophisticated. Very sophisticated. All right. One more thing that I'd like to show you before we take a look at the ID software is I want to I want to hook up a different microphone here just so that we can get a sense of how this works. So bear with me for one second. Okay. Okay, as you can see, I've now hooked up another microphone to the device. And it's a dynamic microphone, and that dynamic microphone requires a lot more gain. This microphone is the Shure SM7B. And one thing that, the, if you're familiar with microphones, one thing you know about the Shure SM7B is that it requires a ton of gain. It requires a lot of gain in order to get a good signal out of it. Just by the design of the microphone itself. It needs a lot of gain. And what happens a lot of time at the lower price point, the modest price point preamplifier interfaces, is they often have a reputation for not having enough gusto in order to drive something like a 7B so that you have to buy additional equipment. You might commonly hear them hear it called a cloud lifter, a fat head, and a bunch of other devices. But those are probably the two most common devices that you'd have to plug in in between the microphone and the interface in order to get a good signal out of a challenging microphone such as the Shure SM7B. And the reason you have to do that is because a lot of times on these preamplifiers, if you need to turn them all the way up, as I have here, turn that all the way up, that last couple of percent often means that the microphone or the preamplifier introduces a ton of noise. Hiss, hiss that just pervades the entire signal. my stomach growl. But 
It doesn't. These preamplifiers, the preamplifiers on the audience series, the ID series, they are, they're just silent. They're silent. And that's one of the things I really like about the audience preamplifiers is they are so quiet even at maximum gain. So even though this only supplies 58 decibels of gain, it's 58 decibels of clean, transparent gain. So you still get plenty of signal out of a challenging microphone like the SM7B. Plenty of signal coming out of here so that you don't need to spend another $100, $150 just to make the microphone work. So I wanted to make sure that you had a chance to hear a sure SM7B through the ID14. Okay, lastly, uh, I want to just show you the overview of the ID software that you would get that uh, is sort of the driver software for the uh, for the the device for the ID14. The ID software is required for all of the ID. Um, it's not required, but is encouraged to be installed for all of the IT devi ID devices. Uh, and depending on which device you have, you'll get different functions. So these are the functions specifically for the ID14. If you have an, uh, an ID4, it's going to be different. Or if you have an ID44, it's going to be different. You may also hear some underlying hiss come in. And that's because there's a laptop recording the screen down here. And the screen recording makes the laptop fan comes on. Sorry about that. It's not in the microphone. It's not in the preamp. It's just because there's a laptop right here recording. But the ID software, what it does is it allows you to um, configure the device. You have some control over the device. You have different buttons. So I can, uh, I can sum to mono. I can adjust the, the volume of the monitors or the headphones. I can do that from the device. And I also can decide how I want those different mixes to come out. If you recall, uh, if you recall last time or earlier, I said uh, that you could adjust uh, a guest headphone mix compared to your headphone mix, or you can make adjustments to the different microphone levels and so forth. You can do that here in the ID software. You get three different mixes. There's a master mix, which is the main output, and then you have two different cues. It'd be like the artist headphone mix, if you would, which you could have go out of the second uh, set of monitors or the headphone jack. Uh, uh, even though there's two headphone jacks, it's going to be one, one mix that goes out that, that jack. But you can actually govern which, how much of each person. So if one person wants to hear their microphone louder than the other, you can just adjust what they hear in that mix. And you get two different uh, mixes in addition to the mix itself. And once you've, set, once you've set those different mixes, you just open up the system panel and you say which output gets which mix. So you can say if you want the main headphones to get the main mix or one of the cue mixes or one of the alternate mixes, you can actually decide which one that is. Really cool, really handy. You can do it and then just save it and it's good. You also can see all of the additional devices. So you can see if there was an optical cable plugged in, you'd be, see, you'd be able to see all of the additional preamplifiers that come in. You're able to uh, identify, you can mix what's coming back from your system, from your DAW. You can adjust those volumes. So you get a lot of control over what this device is doing and what you see coming back from the device. Um, and you can really govern that. Lastly, uh, I can't show it to you here. Uh, but you can also check for updates. Uh, you can check for updates. So sometimes, like I said, this is a pre-production model, so there could be a firmware firmware update. If you do get a firmware update, it can do it directly from the ID software. It'll just say update the firmware. It takes about 90 seconds to download, install, reboot the device, and you're good to go with whatever new features or fixes that they that they introduce. Finally, um, uh, a couple other things, uh, clock source. So if you do have those external microphones, you want to make sure that everything, all those digital signals stay in sync. So you can decide which one is the clock that they all listen to to synchronize their watches. You can decide which one is the clock source. And then you can also decide what uh, what's called a loopback source. Again, it's not something I can demonstrate to you here. But uh, if you do have a, a guest that's remote, for example, let's say you were doing an interview over Skype or something like that, you can set which uh, microphones or which sources go back down the line, down the loopback line, down to the other guests so they don't hear themselves echo or feedback like that. You can actually decide what's going to go back down the line to them as opposed to what they're sending to you. You can, you can adjust that with the loopback. Really handy. 
So just a quick overview. I just want to show you that the ID software uh, does have a lot of capability and it really does help. Even though it's not technically required to use the, the ID software, I personally, I always have it running. I just always have it running. Just runs up in the in the system tray and you're you're going to be good to go. All right, I'm going to stop the recording down here so I can stop those fans from blowing. <laughs> One second. And there you have it. That's the new ID14 Mark II from Audient. Great big thank you to the folks over at Audient for sending the device to me. Really have enjoyed using it. I think they really, uh, they've really done their homework to create a device that really works well for the working voice actor. Great device, right size. I I'm, I'm impressed with it. But I told you, I might be biased. I might be biased. But I did want to share it with you and share my opinions on it. I think that this... Of the ID line, I think for a working voice actor who's going to try and make a go, a job out of using it, I would choose this one over the ID4. The ID4 definitely has things to speak for it, but if you're trying to make a choice between these two one with a, these two devices with a slightly different price point between them, if you're looking long term, the ID14 I think is the right I think is the right choice. I hope that helps. I hope that helps. Uh, Thank you so much to Audient. Thank you so much for watching this whole video. I'm really grateful for it. Now, go get yourself a microphone, maybe a dynamic microphone that needs the power that a good little interface can supply. Wow, that was terrible. But go out, get yourself a microphone so you can get in a booth and you can record something amazing. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks.